So, you think you live your life on the edge. Maybe you're into extreme sports, or you're a fan of bizarre foods, or you like to travel to exotic places. But could you live here? This is an alkaline lake with a pH 11 to 12, and high arsenic and high salt levels. If you put your hands in it for too long, your skin will turn into soap. Would you eat this? These are bacterial biofilms in the coastal lagoons in San Diego, and they're full of protein. Could you survive here, where the salinity of the lake water is often nine times higher than seawater? Those are salt crystals, by the way. How long would you last in those environments? And yet, there's life in all those places, mainly bacterial life, so-called extremophiles. Extremophile means loving the extreme. And these bacteria truly love these extreme environments, and they truly live their life on the edge. I'm a professor of microbiology and sustainability, and for the past few decades, I've been studying these extremophiles and the proteins they make in these extreme environments. And I can tell you, bacteria are everywhere. And they have been there much longer than us as well, and they will be there much longer than humans are going to be around as well. There are an estimated 10 to the 30th bacteria on the planet. That's a one with 30 zeros after it. That's called a nonillion, by the way. Have you ever walked out at night on a, and looked up on a clear sky and you wondered how many stars there were in the universe? Well, there's 10 to the 22nd to 10 to the 24th stars in the universe. That means there's at least a million times more bacteria on the planet than stars in the universe. And we depend on them for our health and for our environment. Now, you may already, on, already know about um, the importance of a healthy gut microbiome for health conditions like obesity, diabetes, heart health, even mental health. But did you know that bacteria in every environment are important for the removal of toxic wastes and the recycle of important chemicals like oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus? A few grams of, of soil contain about a billion bacteria in them, and they're important for soil ecology, recycling waste and recycling nutrients. The world's oceans and seas have about 10 to the 26 microorganisms in them. And they produce important things for us, like 50% of the oxygen that humans breathe in. That means every other breath you take, the oxygen in there is produced by microorganisms in the oceans. As I tell my microbiology students every year in class, we live in a microbial world. And the world as you know it wouldn't exist for very long without bacteria in it. But here's the interesting part. From all those bacteria out there, we have only discovered and studied less than 2% of what's out there. Part of my job is to do taxonomy and phylogeny of bacteria, which means I have to uh, characterize and classify new species. And with more than 98% yet to be discovered, that's some great job security for me right there. <laughs> Our lab recently discovered or helped discover a new bacterial family, the Halorhodospiraceae, which live in extreme salty conditions. By the way, to put this in perspective, discovering a new taxonomic family is like if you're a scientist and you study all the animals on planet Earth, and so far you've seen humans and horses and dogs, but suddenly you find giraffes. That's the equivalent of finding a new bacterial taxonomic family. So you can understand our excitement when we find these new uh, discoveries. Many microbiologists live by the idea that everything is everywhere. And, um, Given the right conditions, anywhere on the planet you can find the same bacterial species. And there's certainly some merit to that idea, but I think with so much yet to be discovered, that's kind of an oversimplified way of looking at the microbial world. Nevertheless, sometimes we find surprisingly similar species in very distant locations. One example close to home is the discovery of this species of river bacterium as the dominant species in the Nebraska salt marshes. You may not realize that over 100 million years ago, Nebraska was covered by a large sea, and that covered about 20,000 acres. And <clears throat> all that's left of that today is the salt marshes that are spread out around the state. It is one of the few places in the US where the naturally occurring groundwater is salty. So the discovery of river bacterium in, in, that, uh, in those conditions was quite interesting because that species had only been found previously in one other place in the world an alkaline salt lake in eastern Siberia. Now, for many of you that live here, these cold Nebraska winters might feel like Siberia to you, <laughs> but we were quite surprised to find these species here thousands of miles away. So maybe everything can be everywhere if the conditions are right. 
At this point, you might wonder, well, how can you tell one bacterium from another? Because you're right. Under the microscope, they all look like small little dots. This image shows an extremophile on the one side and a common gut bacterium on the other side. And unless you have some unusual superhuman x-ray vision, I think you'll agree that you can't really tell them apart from this. If you can't tell them apart, come talk to me afterwards and I might have a job for you. <laughs> so how do we tell these bacteria apart <clears throat> from one environment to another? Well, <clears throat> and tell them what they can do and how they can adapt to these environments. So it turns out that um, the key to living on the edge is in the DNA. So our lab sequences genomes from these bacteria from extreme environments and compares them to the genomes from other environments. And then we can see what genes they have, what proteins they make, and then what things they can do and how they adapt to these environments. For example, we see that bacteria that live in uh, very salty environments, they have specialized molecules inside the cell that compensate for the high salt outside the cell. Or they make specialized pumps that pump the salt out of the cell when it needs to. Another species from Yellowstone that we sequenced can survive high amounts of radiation, and it has specialized enzymes that repair the DNA damage after radiation. And then there's a species that I isolated from those coastal lagoons in San Diego a couple of years ago that can survive high UV radiation. It makes its own sunscreen molecule when it needs it inside the cell. By the way, most people when they go to San Diego, they go to the beach, but I like to go a little bit more off the beaten path and find these bacterial biofilms in these coastal lagoons nearby. You can't wear your flip-flops when you go there, but it is where the great discoveries and adventures are found. As you can imagine, some of these um, survival mechanisms and adaptations that these bacteria have can have applications in biotechnology and industry. And we are seeing that being used in um, food industry and in agriculture and even in the pharmaceutical industry. Think, for example, about um, the PCR-based COVID tests. The enzyme used in there comes from an extremophile. The enzymes in your laundry detergent that you use to break down dirt particles in your clothes at higher temperature, those come from extremophiles. Many of the enzymes in biomass to bioenergy conversion, they come from extremophiles. If nothing else, you learn a new word today, extremophiles. <laughs> so <clears throat> there's many more examples out there as well. But we don't just study these bacteria from extreme environments. We also look at the bacteria that are um, in your house, in the soil in your garden, and on you. Yes, they are everywhere. But for the most part, they help you. And I know that's a tough sell coming right out of the pandemic, but they do help you. Bacteria are a lot like people. Most of them are good, but there are always a few bad ones you want to stay away from. So we look at compare bacteria from one environment to another, see what species are there, what genes they have, what they can and cannot do. Uh, for example, a recent study I did together with my colleague, Dr. Tyler Moore, we looked at the soil microbiome from um, different types of gardens. We looked at gardens planted with turf grass and gardens planted with native plants from Nebraska. We sampled about uh, 13 different sites around Omaha and Lincoln, and we found that the native gardens have a much higher microbial diversity in them than the turf grass ones which usually means a better ecosystem. They also have more species in them that capture carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide, which are greenhouse gases. Therefore, planting more native plants in your garden might have a positive impact on climate change, besides the obvious benefit of attracting more pollination and more insect diversity as well. If you want to learn more about this project, um, <clears throat> we are actually looking for more community samples as well. We are starting a citizen science project next year um, and we want to get more samples from around the state, especially from native gardens and native prairies. So if you want to get your hands dirty yourself and sample for us, contact me afterwards and I can get you a sample packet. You can take that home with you and then be a scientist yourself for a day. We will then sequence all these samples in our lab and compare them to the various samples from around the state and then study the larger impact of native plants on the soil microbiome in the Midwest. And we'll, we'll make these uh, results available over the next two years to the public as well. So in the end, I want you to remember that bacteria are everywhere. And it may be humbling to realize that you, I should say we as humans, are small. And bacteria are big, at least by the numbers. So keep in mind that they give us everything, and we couldn't survive without them. So remember to take care of these little critters. The things you do in your daily lives have an impact on the microbes that are on you, in you, and around you. So by eating healthier foods, smarter use of antibiotics, 
and planting some native, native plants in your garden, you can be a better probiotic to yourself and the world around you. So be grateful to these bacteria, because they give you everything, and they ask for nothing in return, really. And remember to love your extremophiles, because they can outcompete you any day. <laughs> Thank you.